Good evening, everyone. And welcome to another exciting conversation in our Cultural Lens and Film Speaker Series. The Film and Speaker Series introduces film scholars, authors, artists, activists to campus or Zoom in this case to address various topics and how those topics are being defined and portrayed through media and aims to drive discussion. Tonight, we are happy to have Dr. Clint Smith join us. I am Michelle Allen. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, the Director of Diversity Education in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. I am your trusted facilitator and conversationalist for the night. And without further ado, I'm gonna read Dr. Clint Smith's bio. Clint Smith is a father, educator, poet, scholar, social justice fighter, and a bona fide truth speaker. He is a staff writer at The Atlantic and relevant to tonight's conversation, the author of the narrative nonfiction book, How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning with History of Slavery Across America, which was a number one New York Times bestseller and the author of uh, the poetry collection, Counting Descent, which won the 2017 Literary Award for Best Poetry Book from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. Dr. Smith was born and raised in New Orleans and currently resides in Maryland with his wife and two children. He has a BA in English from Davidson College and a recent 2020 graduate from Harvard University with a PhD in education. I was first introduced to Clint through his poetry and spoken word on YouTube and as a co-host of one of my favorite po podcasts, Pod Save the People. A simple YouTube search will render multiple TED Talks his YouTube series titled A Crash Course in Black American History and recitations of poetry that I promise you will rock the soul. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Smith. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Michelle. Yes, thank you. So I want to say, in order, before I even start this conversation, I am sitting here as a fan. I am a fan of your work. I've been following the podcast. But I also have to acknowledge, like the strongest ram I know when to back down, my friend Kylie Stam, who I know is screaming right now, is a bigger fan of you than I am. She, when I told her that I was going to be leading this conversation, she probably screamed for about 10 seconds straight, which was awkward to listen to on the phone. And because of you, our text thread today has way too many exclamation points and way too many yeses, right, all in one thread. So I am so excited to be talking to you today. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, you and, and thank you, Kylie, for the enthusiasm. Um, and I should say, as I told you all before, I should I should say for the audience, um, you all are, are probably used to this in this in these sort of virtual times right now. But uh, I'm home with my two kids. I have a four year old and a two year old and uh, mom was supposed to be home by now, but there's a lot of traffic. And so they are currently in the room next door watching an episode of Daniel Tiger. Uh, and we'll see how long that sustains their attention. They might come join us. Uh, they might not, but we'll uh, we'll see. Absolutely, absolutely. We could be flexible. I think we've all kind of had practice negotiating time and making and making bargainings with our children or pets in the background in the Zoom environment. So we can definitely rock with it today. So my first question is centered on the concept of time. So before how the word was passed and before you were Dr. Smith, uh, you had already achieved what I consider levels of success and notoriety for your work as a scholar, as an educator, as a poet. So I am curious, what compelled you to trade what I perceive as the freedom that is offered in poetry, where you get to be the knowledge holder and bearer of your own work, you get to be the, authorita the authoritarian in your scholarship for what I consider the hollowed halls of academia, where there are so many hegemonic forces trying to tell you what is worth knowing and what should be told. So my question ultimately is why the PhD, why this beautiful text and why now? Yeah, I mean, I think that the way that I think about it is that I'm part of a tradition of scholars and a tradition of thinkers and a, a lineage of, of black folks who, who reject the idea that uh, we should be anything. I'll hold on one second, like I said. All right. Um, who reject the idea that we should be sort of operating in, in, in silos or that we should be operating um, as if there should be specific demarcations between mm -hmm. the way we, we, we do our work. Um, you know, I think of somebody like Du Bois um, who was a sociologist 
but he was also a novelist, but he was also a poet. But he was also an activist, but he was also uh, an anthropologist. And he was also, uh, you know, engaged in politics. And so, you know, I was Neil Hurston, an anthropologist, uh, uh, a folklorist, uh, an oral historian, uh, a novelist who, who did all of these different things. And so for me, I'm very much, I'm governed by my curiosities. Like that is what shapes the way that I approach any given project, any type of work. Um, and, and I love playing with form and I love playing with genre and I love uh, figuring out, you know, in this book in and of itself began as a collection of poetry. You know, so my first book was a collection of poetry. And this book, when I first started wrestling with these questions was, uh, I thought that the conceit would be that each poem would be about a statue, different statue in New Orleans. Um, mm. And it would, the, and that would sort of be the, the through line between all of the, uh, the poems and the text. And then part of what I realized as I was sort of, uh, you know, thinking about these, these questions was that it, lead, it needed a little more room to breathe. It lead, needed a little bit more space. And it also needed to include voices that weren't my own. I didn't want it to be just my own reflections on a specific place. I wanted it to be a, a broader set of reflections about many places. Mm -hmm. um, and so oftentimes what happens is that a project might begin in one form or genre and then uh, evolve over the course of time into something else. Uh, and, and I think that you kind of just follow what the, the work is telling you it needs to do and what it needs to be. Um, and and, and it's, it's exciting to me. You know, I, I, I written now a collection of poetry, a, a book of nonfiction. Um, and I also hope to, you know, write a novel. I'd love to write a play. I'd love to, I, I just, I love playing in different uh, spaces because I think that different forms and genres and mediums allow you to do different types of things. And, and to your point about academia versus poetry versus journalism, I hope what comes across in this book um, is that it, I'm sort of breaking apart genre and then putting it back together as something else. I hope what it feels like, like I wanted to create a, a book of history that read like a novel. I wanted to create a book of history, a book of nonfiction uh, that felt cinematic. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so very much poetry very much informed the way that I wrote and thought about what I wanted this project to look like because what poetry has done is, is it's taught me to pay attention. Uh, it has taught me to uh, remember that no detail is too small. So when I'm all, at all these different historical sites, I'm thinking about what it smells like, what it looks like, what the air tastes like. What does it feel like to stand on that soil, in this home, on this in this place, on that land, um, and to describe it in as much detail as as possible, so that the reader feels like they're they're in that place alongside me. Absolutely, and I can say you definitely did that for me, and I think anyone that read the text will agree. And so that kind of builds right into my next question as I try to you know weave all of this together. So as I read the text. What I perceived was a lot of what is near dear to my heart, which is narrative inquiry and storytelling, mm -hmm. right? Is what I used in my dissertation and is what I perceived again in what in the text here. So what I loved about it is that it amplified the power of the story and the way that you tell stories is masterful, right? The details, like you said, there's so much specificity that it felt like I was at Monticello with you. It felt like that I was, you know, at the door of no return, right? It felt like I was at those places. And so I want to ask the question and really kind of highlight the fact that storytelling is more or really less about the regurgitating of facts, right? It's less about um, how we remember a place, but more about the emotion that someone's story can evoke, right? More about how that story impacts how we are, how we move through the world, how we identify. So, what story do you think America? is telling itself about itself right now in the current zeitgeist? And do you think the rest of the world is buying it? Hmm. I, maybe it would be helpful if I sort of grounded, especially for those who, who haven't read the text or aren't familiar with the text, if I gave, I think I can answer that question by giving a sense of like what motivated me to write this, this book mm -hmm. in the first place. And so in May of 2017, I was watching the statues of uh, three Confederate leaders come down in my hometown in New Orleans. So the statue of PGT Beauregard, uh, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, Confederate generals and president. And I was watching these statues come down from my home here in Maryland via video stream. And I was thinking about what it meant that I grew up in a majority black city in which there were more homages to enslavers than there were to enslaved people. 
and what are the implications of that? What does it mean that to get to school, I had to go down Robert E. Lee Boulevard. To get to the grocery store, I had to go down Jefferson Davis Parkway. That my middle school was named after a leader of the Confederacy. That my parents still live on a street named after someone who owned 150 enslaved people. And what does that mean? Like, what are the implications? Because we know that symbols and names and iconography aren't just symbols. They are reflective of the stories that people tell. And those stories shape the narratives that communities carry. And those narratives shape public policy and public policy shapes the material conditions of people's lives, which isn't to say that taking down a 60 foot tall statue of Robert E. Lee or making Juneteenth a federal holiday is going to uh, suddenly erase the racial wealth gap. Of course not. But what it is to say is that we, it helps us recognize that these things are a part of this, an, an ecosystem of ideas and stories that help shape how we understand what this country is and how this country understands itself. And once we sort of disabuse ourselves of the myths and narratives that are not grounded in reality, that are not supported by empirical evidence, uh, then we, I think, begin to recognize the ways in which this country has lied to us over the course of time and provides a level of clarity about why our country looks the way that it does. You can look at the, and, and look at the American society and see the reason one community looks one way and another community looks another way is not because of the people in those communities, but is it because of what has been done to those communities generation after generation after generation. It is not a result of cultural dispositions or interpersonal failings. It is, is it, it is a result of plunder and trauma and oppression in a, in a state-sponsored way uh, that has created the landscape of inequality in this country. Uh, and so, you know, the story that America tells about itself is one that is not always aligned with, with what it is. I think about one of the places I go, uh, Monticello, and one of the reasons I went to Monticello was because I think that Jefferson embodies the cognitive dissonance of, of the American psyche uh, and of the American story, which is to say America is a place that has provided unparalleled opportunity for millions of people across generations in ways that their ancestors could have never imagined. But it has also done so at the direct expense of millions and millions of other people who have been intergenerationally subjugated and oppressed. And both of those things are the story of America. You have to hold both of those things at once. And Jefferson is fascinating because I think he personifies that in the sense that he is somebody who wrote in one document that all men are created equal and wrote in a, another, another document that black people are inferior to whites in both endowments of body and mind. He wrote one of the most important documents in the history of the Western world and also uh, enslaved over 600 people over the course of his lifetime, including four of his own children. And so part of what I was interested in in beginning the book with Monticello, <coughs> excuse me, was thinking about how is a place like Monticello attempting to tell a more expansive and more holistic story of Thomas Jefferson as an entry point to helping its visitors think in a more holistic and expansive and inclusive way about the American story. Because Monticello doesn't just belong to Jefferson. It belongs to the hundreds of enslaved people across generations who built that land, who cultivated that land, who built those buildings, right? The Hemingses, the Fawcetts, the Grangers, and so many other families whose, whose, whose claim to that land, to my mind, is, is greater than Jefferson's. I mean, just logistically, Jefferson was away from Monticello for years at a time, whether it was Philadelphia, DC, Paris, New York City, in his various government functions. Um, and so now Monticello, whereas if you went there 20 years ago, told a very different story about Jefferson and that land, now is attempting to sort of uh, make amends for the story that they perpetuated for many, many years uh, by telling a story about Sally Hemings, by telling a story about Jefferson as an enslaver, by telling a story about uh, the enslaved people who lived there and the families they built and the communities they created and the legacies that they left. Um, and I think that that is a model for what different institute, what a lot of universities are attempting to do, right? It recognized the way that enslaved labor shaped what that university looked like, how it shaped either the specific university or the uh, the, the geographic context uh, and social context that that university is surrounded by and thinking about what does that mean for the story that we need to tell about about this city? What does it mean about the story we need to tell about Washington DC or the story about Birmingham? Um, and how can we be more honest about what has transpired in order to understand how one part of Birmingham looks one way and another part of Birmingham looks another way and that that is not by coincidence, that that is the result of a series of decisions that have been made over the course of time. Absolutely. So then this is a question that I have and I think I maybe should know this in my role since I do diversity education for, for faculty and staff, but how do you hold space when that story, when the word is passed, when truth is told, a more expanded, um, inclusive, 
accurate truth is told, how do you hold space when you are, when people are responding with angst or anger? Like I think about what you shared um, in the text about Blanford, and I can't remember who you were speaking to, but the question that you came away with was, do they not know the history or do they simply not care? Mm -hmm. Right. And even when you mentioned Monticello with the two women that you were talking to there, I found myself reading frustrated that they had no idea about this this other side of Jefferson's life. How do you hold space, um, offer grace if that is your one solution for you? But what do you do, I guess, in the face of denial of that more expanded truth or a more accurate retelling of truth? Yeah. No, that's a, it's a great question. And I think is the question that in many ways sort of animates um, the, the text. And part of what I learned is that, you know, I followed the lead of the public historians and the docents and the tour guides who I met on my journey, who I think embodied that balance between uh, extending a certain level of grace and generosity to people um, in recognizing that because of the systemic and structural failings of our education system, there are many people across this country who, in some ways through no fault of their own, do not understand the history of slavery or American history more broadly, but do not understand the history of slavery in any way that is commensurate with the actual impact that it had on this country. And so it's, you know, if I think about Yvonne from uh, the Whitney Plantation, she's like, I'm not gonna, gonna judge someone or blame someone for the lack of information that they come to this plantation with. But what I am gonna do is that when I present this information to them, expect them to engage with it honestly, rigorously, and, and with accountability, right? Because it's one thing to say like, oh, I didn't know, but now I'm telling you, and you have a responsibility as a human, as a, as a citizen, as a person in this country to say, okay, I might not have known this before, but now I'm being presented with it. And even if it makes me uncomfortable, even if it brings into question so many of the stories that I've been told throughout the course of my life, I have a responsibility and I am accountable uh, to you know, making sure that I effectively and ethically sort of recalibrate my understanding of, Ameri of, of, of American history and how my own, my own story or my own family's story exists in relationship to this new history I'm being encountered with. And so I think about Donna and Grace at, Mon at Monticello you know, it was such a fascinating moment because David, the tour guide at Monticello, had given this masterclass of Jefferson and, and of Jefferson as an enslaver. Jefferson is someone who uh, was, you know, was himself embodied a sort of marathon of cognitive dissonance because Jefferson knew slavery was wrong. And he wrote about it. He's like, this is an abomination. We shouldn't be doing this. And yet he like kept his enslaved people. And yet he had several children by an enslaved woman who was his human property. Um, and so, you know, part of what I think happens is that David is, is outlining this. And then Donna and Grace, after the tour, I go up to them and I was like, well, you know, uh, how did you experience, what, what do you think? What did you think about what you heard from David? Because they were clearly unsettled by what they were hearing. And they were like, man, he really took the shine off the guy. They were like, I had no idea Jefferson owned slaves. I had no idea that Monticello was a plantation. And these are folks who bought plane tickets, who rented cars, who got hotel rooms, who came to this site as almost a sort of pilgrimage to see the home of the third president of the United States and had no idea that he was an enslaver. And for me, that's a microcosm again of the way that there are so many millions of people across this country, again, who don't understand the history of slavery in any way that is uh, commensurate with the impact that it had on this country. But I think that there's a difference between being open to new information um, that you don't know and being antagonistic to information that um, runs counter to the story and narratives that you have uh, situated yourself within. Um, and, and it is difficult for some people. I'm not here to say it's an easy thing to do. If your grandfather and father and mother and your whole community has told you a certain story about who they are and who you are and, and how you fit into the sort of broader American story, and then you encounter people who tell you a different story, one that is grounded in, in primary source documents and empirical evidence and actual history, that kind of complicates the story that your grandpappy told you. That's a, that can be a hard thing. It can be a hard, because, it, because it's an existential identity crisis. 
right? Like this, we are in part shaped by the stories we have been told by the people we love. And if the people we love have told us stories that are incorrect, it can be difficult to just be like, oh, okay, well, they told me this and that's wrong. So now I'm gonna, it, so it's not to say that it's easy, but it is to say that we all have a responsibility to do it in our respective lives. You know, race and slavery is, is one iteration of it, but there are all sorts of different ways that many of us in through the different facets of, uh, of our identities um, are, have to reconcile the love that we have for certain people with the way that those people have uh, perpetuated narratives that are harmful to other groups of people. Um, and, and that can be a tricky thing to do, but it's something that, that we have to do. Absolutely. I always ask when I see someone that is really struggling with the new information that someone is offering, whether it be in a classroom setting or any type of, you know, continuing education, I always ask the question, what would it mean if this were true? What would that mean for you? Right? Because sometimes it's the idea of being able to almost hypothesize or theorize what it would mean as opposed to having to sit with it. And so that's a strategy for, for getting people to come into the conversation, yeah. just to, to tiptoe there. Um, so, okay, on social media, right? I'm a millennial. I've been looking on Instagram and Facebook and I have been inundated with these photos of the Texas Border Patrol. Um, and, you know, and, you know, and thinking about their presence and like you mentioned, the iconography of people mounted on horses, particularly why people mounted on horses wielding what looks to me or looked to me like a lasso or a whip, but now it's being characterized as a horse rein, but either way, being weaponized towards Haitian migrants at the Del Rio Bridge camp. And I immediately connected that to the description of the photo outside of the Angola prison gift shop. The fact that I have to say gift shop after that is still kind of mind blowing to me. But thinking about the, the imagery that is being shared. So for those of you who have not read the text yet, there's a photo um, outside of the gift shop at the Angol Angola prison that, and Clint, you correct me if I'm wrong, um, there's a line of um, men, right, that are in prison in, in, in Angola. And there is a, I think you said a white woman on horseback, right, that is kind of there overseeing them. So then when you compare that to the images that have been all over the news and all over social media of the, what seems to me, cattle-like corralling that is happening of human beings, right? So human beings being corralled into a prison and herded into a prison and human beings fighting for a better life at, at the border there in Texas. I'm wondering what journey does your mind take when attempting to process the ways in which human beings are being vilified, like I said, corralled in two different settings, right? Two different spaces, two different situations, but the similarities are profound to me. I wonder what mind, what journey does your mind take when you juxtapose those two images? Yeah, no, those, those images are, are horrifying. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's any other way to say it. And, you know, in the same way, I've been I've been writing and thinking a lot about Hurricane Katrina. Um, I was born and raised in New Orleans, and Hurricane Katrina was my senior year of high school. And I've been working on a, a project in which I've been revisiting uh, a lot of images and stories from Katrina. And and as I look at these images, I'm just kind of like, it is it is almost impossible for me to imagine that what transpired in New Orleans would have transpired if those people were white. It is like, I tried to imagine that those being like white bodies wading through the water. I try to imagine those white people being in the Superdome for five days, being in the convention center for five days, being on top of their roofs, begging for help. Maybe it would happen, but I have a really, really profoundly difficult time imagining it. So, and I've been, been engaging in the same sort of uh, exercise with those images from the, the border in Texas. I was like, if these were people from a country that in which they were, you know, if, if these were white people, would those uh, rangers on horseback be treating them in the way that they do? And I have, I just have a really difficult time imagining that they would be treating little blonde haired, blue eyed children 
or men or women uh, in that same way. And for context for folks, you know, I think your, your point about uh, Angola is, is important in, in sort of thinking about the parallels. For context, for people who might not be familiar, Angola prison is the largest maximum security prison in the country. It is 18,000 acres wide, bigger than the island of Manhattan. It is a place where 75% of the people held there are black men. Over 70% of them are serving life sentences. And it is built on a former plantation. And what I tell folks is that if you were to go to Germany and you had the largest maximum security prison in Germany, and it was built on top of a former concentration camp in which the people held there were disproportionately Jewish, that place would rightfully be a global emblem of anti-Semitism. It would be abhorrent, it would be disgusting. We would never allow a place like that to exist because it would so clearly run counter to all of our moral and ethical sensibilities. And yet here in the United States, we have the largest maximum security prison in the country in which the vast majority of people held there are black men serving life sentences who work in fields of what was once a plantation for pennies on the hour while someone watches them on horseback with a gun over their shoulder. And so when I go to a place like Angola, part of what I'm thinking about are what are the ways that a history of white supremacy not only enacts physical violence against people's bodies, but also collectively numbs us to certain types of violences that in another global context would be wildly unacceptable. And, and what does it mean that that place has a gift shop? <laughs> what does it mean that in that gift shop they sell you know, sweatshirts and coffee mugs and shot glasses and uh, stuffed animals dressed in prison garb? Uh, and on these shot glasses and coffee mugs, they have Angola, a, a, the silhouette of a watchtower. And above and below the, the silhouette, it says Angola, a gated community. To, to almost make a mockery of the experiences of the thousands of people who continue to be held in, in those cages today. And so, you know, we continue to, whether it be Katrina or the border or uh, Angola, we continue to see the ways in which, as the scholar Sadia Hartman says, the afterlife of slavery shapes, continues to shape the social, economic, and political infrastructure of this country uh, in profound ways, and how the remnants and residue of that history continue to inform the way that people see Black people, uh, the way that people treat Black people, and the way that Black people become entangled in systems, whether it be immigration systems, carceral systems, um, systems in which they are uh, most likely to live in the poorest parts of a city that is most also most likely to flood, uh, which is becoming increasingly relevant as climate change sort of rears its ugly head. But, but yeah, it's, it's something can be, I think, uh, unsurprising, but I'll still, I'll, and, but still continue to be deeply unsettling. And, and that's how I think about those images. Mm -hmm. Unsettling for sure, right? And, and it's hard to reconcile and really wrap your mind around it. You know, I think there's some now some pedantic conversations around, well, it wasn't a, you know, it's not a whip, it's not a, you know, but whether what what the item is, the idea of it being weaponized against human beings right. is 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 the troubling part. So on a on a bit of a lighter note, maybe, have you seen the TV show C on Apple That's TV? Not. No. Okay, so it's a great show for anyone that has it. I'm gonna offer you a little -E. bit of context too. Hmm? S E E C S E E. Yep. One of the main um, one of the main characters, Alfred Woodard's in it, but then also Jason Momoa. But I bring it up for a point. So this is a show that is, and I'm not gonna give any spoilers away, but it is about 500, 500 years into the future, and human beings, as we know it right now, are they have lost sight, right? They can no longer see, right? So but there is one person that can see and is going around um, impregnating women with sighted children with the hope of repopulating the world or at least leading the world with these sighted children. So this guy leaves books for his children to find when they come of age so they can come into knowing, they can read, and they can do something that no one else, as far as we know it in the world, can do. And so I bring that up for a reason. I want to connect that to Dr. Sex's comment from Whitney Plantation about books, the commentary that he offered, and I want to read it to you all. So Dr. Sex says, from the again, from the Whitney Plantation in Louisiana, he said, books are really good, but who can read a book? Who can have access to books? This, referring to the Whitney Plantation, needs to be an open book under the sky that people can come here and see, right? So 
why is it important in terms of accessibility? I mentioned the television so the television show C because it also gets to a matter of access and the importance of the transference of knowledge across generation. Why is it important that we make this knowledge in these histories and these stories accessible? What are we hoping or what are you hoping will happen as a result of knowing a more full and accurate history of this world and its relationship to the African diaspora? Why is it important to make this accessible? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's deeply important. I almost made uh, that comment, the title of the book. I had how the word is passed. And then he said, you know, I remember sitting there. I remember that moment with Dr. Sek. He was like, we need to make this an open book up under the sky. And I was like, an open book under the sky. And I saw the title, but I was, but if so, I went back and forth between open book under the sky and how the word is passed. Ultimately, how the word is passed run out. Um, but but I love I wrote that sentiment down. I describe it in the chapter. I wrote it down and put it in my pocket. It was such a beautiful and moving sentiment. Um, and I think it's accurate. I mean, because part of the whole purpose of this book is a recognition that like there is something that happens when you go to these sites and when you stand on this land and when you stand in these buildings. You know, it's one thing to read about a slave cabin. It's another thing to stand inside of it and to hear the way the wood moans under your feet when, when you make a step, to, to see, to feel the wind sort of sliding through the, the cracks in the wooden planks and think about how susceptible these families would have been to the weather. You know, to walk across the land at Monticello and to consider that like all of the enslaved people who'd walked across that land before you, who, who, who chopped at that mountain to make that land even, even possible to live on to stand inside of the room in uh, Galveston, Texas, um, in the building where, you know, as the mythology holds, uh, the General Granger told 250,000 enslaved people that in Texas that they were free. That is a very singular sort of experience and the sort of, because you can feel the history in your body. You can sort of feel the stories and the narratives sort of streaming through your blood. And what I wanted to do was to the extent that I could in my own book, ironically, is to take the reader and place them there as much as possible. And hopefully ultimately inspire the reader to say like, I wanna visit these sites myself or and in many ways more importantly, not even just these nine sites, but there are sites that, you know, I wrote about nine different places, but there's like 90,000 different places you could visit in this country. I mean, if, if more than that, every, the landscape of slavery where the history of slavery is, is scarred into the landscape of this country everywhere, right? It's everywhere in the South, but also everywhere in the North and the West. And so I, my hope was that people would recognize our physical proximity to this history. And in doing so, recognize our temporal proximity to this history. Because when I stand inside of a slave cabin, part of what it does to me is reminds me that this history we tell ourselves was a long time ago, wasn't actually that long ago at all, right? You know, slavery existed in this country for 250 years and has only not existed for about 150. And so you have an institution that existed for a century longer than it hasn't. You have an institution that, you know, I think all the time about how the woman who opened the National Museum of African American, uh, African -American History and Culture alongside the Obama family in 2016 was the daughter of an enslaved person. She wasn't the granddaughter or the great granddaughter. She was the daughter of someone born into intergenerational chattel bondage in two, and was alive in 2016, just recently passed a few years ago. I think about how my grandfather's grandfather was enslaved. So when my four-year-old son sits in my grandfather's lap, I imagine my grandfather sitting on his grandfather's lap. And I'm reminded that you know, the idea that that history has nothing to do with what our contemporary landscape of inequality looks like, that it has nothing to do with what the social, political, and economic infrastructure of this country look like, is so morally and intellectually disingenuous. Because there are people who are alive today, who loved, who were raised by, who were in community with, who had relationships with, people who were born into chattel slavery. They are alive today. And so I, you know, my hope is that part of what this book does is give people a sense of like, wow, in the scope of human history, 
I mean, this thing was just yesterday. Like it really wasn't a long time ago at all. Absolutely. And so in tying this with, you know, again, getting people to recognize that the things that have been characterized in black and white to give you an air that they happened so long ago, right, are not that long ago. Can you talk a little bit about, I listened to you and Brene Brown talking about this on, on her podcast last night as I prepared for today, but can you say more about the lost cause Right. And and the connection that you make to the lost cause and what we saw on January 6th and the story that is now being told about the insurrection at the Capitol. Can you can you explain those two concepts for for the for the people that are tuned in? Yeah. So the lost cause is this uh, narrative that was perpetuated by the South and, and in many folks and by many folks in the North, unfortunately, after the war. Um, which suggested that the Civil War was not about slavery, uh, which uh, suggested that even if it was, slavery was a largely ben benevolent institution um, that was necessary for the civilization uh, and Christianization of, of the savage African, uh, and that the people who were fighting this war were doing so not because they wanted to perpetuate human bondage, um, which, mind you, wasn't even that bad in the first place, as they say, but because they wanted to protect their families from uh, the, the Northern aggression, that they wanted to protect their culture, that they wanted to protect states' rights and the sort of economic um, freedom that they had in the South. Uh, and all of these things are things that are not actually grounded in reality. All, you, all one has to do in order to understand what the Confederacy fought for is look at the examples through the declarations of Confederate secession that the Confederate uh, government signed and, and put forth themselves. So you have a state like Mississippi that writes, you know, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material good in the world. So they were not uh, vague about why they were seceding from the union. They were quite clear about it. But what happens is over time, you have people who lo lost a war, who are ashamed that they lost this war, who are now entering a uh, a moment in history when there are relatively few uh, Western countries that continue to sustain, you continue to have slavery um, as part of their social infrastructure. Um, where you know you have Britain and France, who literally part of the reason that Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation was because he wanted to prevent Britain and France from entering the war on the side of the Confederacy. And by making the war specifically about slavery, by making it so that informally enslaved people were fighting as soldiers in the Union Army, he made it so that Britain and France, which imagined themselves as being anti-slavery countries, they were like, oh, we're not going to have a relationship with the Confederacy because they exist. They always did, to be clear, but now it, it had some semblance of or formality that they were uh, in a, a country, a territory that seceded to perpetuate the institution of human bondage and they didn't want to be on the side of that. So all that's to say they were ashamed and now they try to rewrite a narrative that makes it seem like that wasn't the case so that they can re-enter um, American society, re-enter sort of global society and not be understood as, as pariahs or, uh, or, or ethically dubious um, people. Uh, and so it is largely successful because you have, you know, they put up statues and they uh, create and, and put things in school textbooks and they um, engage in this sort of mass propaganda effort that distorts in this Orwellian sort of way, people's collective understanding about what the Civil War was fought over to the point that now, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center in 2018, only 8% of US high school seniors were able to identify slavery as the central cause of the Civil War. Eight. Right? And that was three years ago. And obviously given everything that's happened over the past three years, that number might be a little bit different and hopefully higher now. But then in 2018, 8% of high school seniors would, would only 8% would be able to identify that. It's telling, and it is telling because of the success of the lost cause. And, and what we saw on January 6th is that we, we, saw, we saw for all of our, you know, with all of our own eyes, what was happening. Uh, we heard what they were saying, we saw what they were doing, and we saw how close they were to taking the lives of, of people in, 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 in our Congress. And now we are being told 
we are being gaslit uh, to say that like people are saying, oh, this was just, you know, there was no violence. This was just a regular tour. These are just patriots. These are just people who were um, trying to express themselves. They weren't gonna hurt anybody. And the sort of gaslighting that we see happening right now is analogous to the gaslight that was gaslighting that was happening in the late 19th century after the war, because you got somebody like uh, Alexander Stevens, for example, the former vice president of the Confederacy, who after the war, people are like, what do you have to say for yourself? Like you were the vice president of this horrific territory and institution. And, uh, and you wrote in the famous infamous cornerstone speech that uh, the, found the Confederacy is founded on the principle of African inferiority. It is founded on the great principle that the Negro is not equal to the white man. It is founded on the great principle that slavery should be perpetuated indefinitely. Um, and then after the war, he's like, I never said that. And everybody's like, wait, what? Like, what are you talking about? We were there. We saw you. We heard you give the speech. It's in all the papers. And he's like, no, no, no. You must be mistaken. I never said anything like that. But that's what's been happening for centuries now, right? Like that was just a 19th century iteration of what we're seeing in the 21st century. And so it has been a, a, an extended project that folks have been engaged in. Um, and it remains to be seen the extent to which uh, it will, you know, I'll be curious to see how successful it is this time around. Um, and if people are, uh, if the narrative around January 6th years from now is reflective of what actually happened or is, or is softened um, by the sort of propaganda effort of, of many people who are in, in many corners of, of this country being successful because we have <clears throat> excuse me, different sort of media ecosystems in which people in this country operate with fundamentally different epistemological realities, right? Like people don't have the same set of truth and sets right. of knowledge with which to understand what's happening in front of them because they're just being spewed lies over and over again, online, on television, and all these different places. So it's a dangerous moment, um, but it remains to be seen how it ultimately manifests itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so taking a gander into the future, right? So at present, you and I are sitting here, two doctors of education, right? One cisgender man, one queer cisgender woman, you and I both, right, can, I think, can agree that the ivory tower probably never anticipated that people that look like us would be walking down the halls, uh, people that are embodied as we are. And, and when we talk about when the word is passed, historically, the word would have passed over us, right, because the, the, it wasn't intended for us. But here we are claiming a radical critical geography. And I wonder, and I think about the uh, comment that was offered from Elwa at Gore Island that says, we have to use education to deconstruct in order to reconstruct, All right? And so thinking about that, if I could call on my, my sister foremother, Audrey Lord and her discussion of the master's tools, I wonder if you could use your own set of tools, masters of other or otherwise to deconstruct the existing narrative and reconstruct a righteous retelling of America, one that your children could learn, my future children could learn from, and its relationship to slavery, what would that story be? Mm. You're giving like beautiful questions that are like better than my answers. That was so Well, beautiful. I mean, I was inspired by the poetic language in the text, so I'm just trying to show oh, up I, and I, be I my best. I was, I was like, <laughs> I'm gonna have to get that, get that written down. I might have to make a poster of that. Uh, that's a compliment i'll let you answer though <laughs> no, that was beautiful um i think part of what has to be done part of what i'm really interested in right now sort of following this book are two things i'm really obsessed with oral histories um and and you can tell at the 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 last chapter of the book the epilogue of the book is are these sort of oral histories from my grandparents um and these interviews that are trying to get a sense of of how they were shaped by the, the forces of Jim Crow uh, that animated the, the early parts of, of, of their lives. Born, you know, my grandfather born in 1930, Jim Crow, Mississippi, my grandmother born in 1939, Jim Crow, Florida. And I learned so much from those conversations uh, in way and, and learned things that I might not have ever learned if I hadn't sat down and asked them. And part of what I'm interested in 
is like, what are the ways in which we might be able to collect the stories of, of our elders today um, and preserve those stories? Uh, because sometimes the stories that we have of people from different eras are, are of people who, who did exceptional or remarkable things, right? We have the story, you know, in the context of slavery, we have the stories of uh, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Harriet Jacobs, Lotto Equiano, Henry Box Brown, people who, many of whom, who like wrote biographies or, um, or had biographies written about them. But the thing about like, you know, Har Harriet Tubman or Frederick Douglass is that like, those are, those are exceptional people, not just like exceptional enslaved people, like those are exceptional individuals. Like the universe does not make a lot of people like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. And so what that means is that the story the stories of Douglas and Tubman, which to be clear, like I think are deeply important. I've read almost everything that Douglas has ever written, are not reflective of the stories of the vast majority of enslaved people. And so we can learn a lot from those stories, but they won't teach us what it was like to be a typical enslaved person in the South. And so that's why narratives like the, excuse me, the Federal Writers Project, um, initiative, which interviewed over 2,300 formerly enslaved people um, who, who did not escape, who did not learn how to read, who did not, you know, who were just experiencing slavery as, as people, as ordinary people, which is what most of us are, just ordinary people trying to make a sense, trying to create meaning and purpose in our lives to the, to the best extent that we can. And in their case, in the context of, of unimaginably, unimaginably difficult circumstances. And so part of what I think we need to do is make sure that we are collecting the stories of, of people who are, you know, who are not John Lewis, who are not uh, Jesse Jackson, who are not these, you know, these individuals who represent stories that need to be told, but are like, who is the grandmother who was like living in Greensboro when those college students sat down? And like, how did she experience that moment? Who were the, uh, who was the church lady? who was sitting in that church when Martin Luther King was there and like, how does she remember that moment? And so that's what a part of what I think about, you know, when I think about the legacy of the Federal Writers Project and the oral histories that were collected with enslaved people to preserve the stories that came after that, uh, we need to make sure that we're, we're working actively and proactively in doing so. And the other part of it is that I'm really interested in, uh, in landscapes. And so, you know, obviously this book is about memorials and monuments. And so I think about something in Germany, like the, what's called the translation, the English translation is the stumbling stones. And in, in Germany, they have tens of thousands of these stumbling stones in which, you know, you, if you go in front of uh, a McDonald's or a Burger King or a yoga studio or an art gallery or a hotel, in front of the building, it will have a slightly elevated brass plate sort of amid the concrete and the bricks and on it it will say the name of the people who lived in what that house that house the house that it used to be the residence maybe it's still a residence maybe it's a commercial uh real estate a piece of real estate but it'll have the names of the people who who lived there and it will have the dates of the, their birth dates and then also describe what happened to them and where they were so if they were taken from that home and sent to Auschwitz, if they were taken from that home and sent to another death camp somewhere. And so you can't walk anywhere in Berlin without encountering regular reminders of what was done in your name as a German citizen. And that's not to say Germany's perfect. That's not to say Germany doesn't struggle with its own, uh, you know, fascism and anti-Semitism that's still present there. But there is something that different that is happening in the theater of memory in which there are monuments, there are no monuments to Nazis, but there are many monuments to what Nazis did. And so you are regularly reminded of what has happened and that it didn't happen that long ago. And so what would it look like if here in the United States, we were encountering our own version of stumbling stones? If we were encountering before we stepped into that 7-Eleven, before we stepped into that house, before we stepped into that school, that hotel, wherever, you were reminded of the people who were sold from there of the people who, uh, who built that building, of the people who uh, paved that road, of the people who 
uh, were separated from their family on this land, like with regular reminders of what was done. I think what would happen, I think it would help contribute to a more robust collective understanding of, of what, uh, what was done in America's name. What, one of our, you know, alongside native genocide, one of our original sins was. Um, and I think that, you know, that's not gonna solve all our problems, but I think uh, the process of memorialization uh, and the project of memorialization is, is one that is deeply important. Mm. So, I mean, almost in perfect fashion. So I know there's a vibe happening here. You just answered one of the questions that we had received uh, from one of our, from one of the people that are tuned in. And it was at, it, they were asking specifically about what you just answered in the latter part of uh, your response about Germany in the, in the Holocaust and their response and how they've taken a different a different route than what we have. And then the question was asked, what is needed to confront that dark history? And so you just kind of articulated that. But we have another question that came in that I wanna ask you while we have time. And it says, a lot of what has been talked about today has a direct connection to critical race theory and history that has already occurred in this country. The question asks, do you think that history will repeat itself again? Or do we have a critical mass of people that can overcome this? What do you think? I think part of what we're seeing with regard to the critical race theory phenomenon uh, is, is it is a direct backlash to the fact that over the course of the past several years, more people in this country have developed a more robust and, and more acute understanding of how the history of, of slavery and Jim Crow and, and, and anti-Black and anti-Indigenous anti-Latino impression, um, uh, the, the way that oppression, the, the interdifferent iterations of that, that oppression have shaped what our contemporary landscape of inequality look like today, which is to say, you know, an example I always give, I, uh, I joke that in 2013, if you ask somebody what redlining was, most people would have been like, is that a type of makeup? Is that like part of Rihanna's new, new you know, lipstick line? What, like redlining, what is that? And now more, you know, not everybody, but a lot more people understand it as a mechanism by which uh, state sanctioned segregation was perpetuated through the mid 20th century. Mm -hmm. And that means something. That's, I mean, that's important. Like our lexicon, our collective lexicon and framework and language about what racism is and how it manifests itself, right? Understanding that it's not, it is not just an interpersonal phenomenon, but it is a structural, one. it is a systemic one. I think we see it in the way that people talked about COVID. I think if COVID happened 10 years ago, you know, and we were seeing the way that Black and Latinx and Indigenous folks were being disproportionately impacted, mm -hmm. there would have been a lot of uh, uh, indictments of the, of the culture. It would have been, you know, said to be reflective of um, cultural dispositions or people just need to be more responsible. People just need to work harder to avoid it. And there would have not been the same to the same extent uh, in our sort of larger media and political discourse, there would not have been engagement with the, the history of medical discrimination, the history of medical mistreatment that make uh, Black people's relationship to the sort of larger medical infrastructure more complicated um, than maybe some of their counterparts. There wouldn't have been conversations about uh, low-wage jobs and, and which people are disproportionately being uh, working in uh, frontline, uh, doing frontline jobs uh and and how that is tied to the sort of way that our education system has funneled certain people in one direction certain people in another there wouldn't have been conversations about who lives in multi-generational homes and why and all of these things that are like systemic reasons why black and brown folks were being disproportionately impacted and continue to be disproportionately impacted by this virus and i say all that because like more and more people know that you know, more and more people are reading books like mine, reading books like Ibram Kendi, reading books like uh, Ta-Nehisi, reading books like Eve Ewing, reading, you know, all these folks. And, and I think that the CRT is people who feel like the story that they have held on to about this country is being challenged. Mm -hmm. and, in, and within it, that they are being challenged, right? Like it is a challenge to who they have told themselves they are in the world how they have accrued power in the world. And so when people begin to learn 
that the reason you are in your position or the reason that you have what you have and they have what they have is not singularly down to you worked hard and they didn't work hard, but is actually the result of like a sort of intergenerational set of, of system structures and phenomena that, that have made it so that certain people's lives are put on different trajectories before they're even born sometimes. Mm -hmm. Then that sort of myth of meritocracy that is pervasive across this country disintegrates. It just falls flat. And, and that is, as we talked about at the beginning, that's an existential threat for some people. And they don't, so they're like, no, we're not gonna teach about, Mar we're not gonna teach American history. You can't teach about racism. You can't, cause they know that if more kids begin to learn it, we can begin to have a different, uh, a society that has a different baseline with which to understand why American society looks the way that it does today. And mm -hmm. so I think the CRT is very much a direct response to the Black Lives Matter movement that has, you know, people talk about whether Black Lives Matter is successful or not, like did they enact any policy legislation? I think there's like, there's cha political change with the big P with like, you know, legislation and whatnot. And there's political change that is also, that reflect with the little P that sort of reflects like cultural and social shifts and changes. And what is absolutely true is that because of the Black Lives Matter movement, we are having a, a more sophisticated discussion as a country about what racism is and, and by extension, what all sorts of, what all other sorts of isms are uh, because this movement has largely been led by queer black women and who are demanding that we are recognizing the intersectionality of, of all the different parts of our identity and all the ways that those shape, uh, those things shape how, how each of us navigate the world in both similar and dissimilar ways. Mm, absolutely. So I, I want to wrap up our conversation in the heart of service and philanthropy, right? So in the wake of Hurricane Ida, I have, and many of you may have discovered that the Whitney Plantation that is referenced in the text, um, if you haven't read the text yet, um, Beyonce's Lemonade is also shot parts of it at the Whitney Plantation, which is the only museum in Louisiana that is committed to telling the story of enslavement here in the U.S. From the, from the perspective of the enslaved, right? And so it has sustained an enormous amount of damage in the wake of Hurricane Ida. And, you know, we run the risk of losing one of our vessels of storytelling um, if we don't offer assistance, if we can't step in and do something to help. Because, you know, if this was the Louvre or if it was another facility that would be tons of people offering large amounts of money to sustain it, rebuild, as that has happened before. And so I want to ask you, Clint, in closing, what, what can we do um, if donating is, is the primary way to assist? What can be done to assist the Whitney right now in, in the wake of what they are experiencing um, with Hurricane Ida. And not that you're a spokesperson for the Whitney, I don't want to put you in that position at all, but if you have any information that you can share as we get ready to close out today's conversation. Oh, you're muted, sorry. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, I, I just put the link to donate to the Whitney in the chat. Um, I mean, that is, they, they need money and they need resources. They're trying to rebuild their infrastructure. They're trying to continue to pay um, the, their employees. Um, and, and I think donating and spreading the word and talking about how important this institution is um, can go a long way. Uh, and, and I think that part, part, you know, beyond that, part of what we should do is, is demand of other plantations uh, across the South um, and other institutions, whether they be a plantation or not, you know, ask questions uh, about like, well, what, what story are you telling about this place and what story are you not? Uh, because unless they are challenged on it, part of what I found when I went to all these places, some that are in the book, some that aren't, is like, when I asked them about it, that was the first time they had ever been asked, like, well, why, you know, yeah, you know, well, I went to Blanford and they were, you know, I was like, well, why is it that we talk about, you're talking about the windows, but you're not talking about what the windows are meant to commemorate? Like, how are we having a whole tour about the, the Tiffany windows in this chapel and not talking about the fact that they are commemorating and memorializing people who fought a war to keep my ancestors in chains. It feels like something's missing. And they were like, they were, pretty, they were like very forthright. They were like, well, nobody's ever, ever really asked us that before. Mm. So I think that that, those sort of, those things, and it's like bringing those up for institutions 
they have a responsibility to tell uh, tell a more holistic story is uh, is important. And I think it's you know as important as the sort of material allocation of resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you, Dr. Smith, for joining us this evening. I want to thank you for your candid response. I want to thank you for your scholarship, your time um, in the midst of everything that's going on. You have the sniffles, you have children that are watching Daniel the Tiger, but you took the time to be with us this evening. And I am deeply appreciative. Thank you for everyone that is tuned in. If you have not already purchased the book, I really encourage you all to read How the Word is Passed by Dr. Clint Smith. If there, and we also have two other uh, cultural lens um, events that are coming up very soon. You see them highlighted on the screen here. Be sure to visit ODEI's website to register for these events and make sure that you stay in the loop with all of the information that we have coming out. If there's nothing else, Dr. Smith, thank you again for your time. It's been a pleasure. Everyone have a good evening and stay safe. Thank you all so much. Thank you for being patient with my children, my, the cold that my children gave me. And uh, this was, was a real delight. I put my newsletter in the chat um, where people can stay up to date with things happening, uh, things I'm reading, writing, watching, uh, thinking about. So sign up for that if you're uh, curious for more of the sort of things that we talked about tonight. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>